Hi, this is Paul. Sunday, I released a video on the Michaela Peterson, John McRae conversation called Real Conversations, Authentic Churches, More Psychedelic Chatter. And I noted in that video that there was a bunch of stuff, and at least one thing in particular that I really wanted to touch on, but I didn't want to do it in the context of that video. So I thought I might just pick it up here. Yeah. Oh, no, we got to have the sound set up properly for that. Hang on, hang on, hang on. This is like the Grim Grizz show. I'm making stuff up as I go along. Let's try it now. It does. This is, so this is where I've had a difficult time understanding. Why would the act of sacrifice, like so Jesus, is, which, is, which is, he's basically sacrificing himself. He agrees to do this. Yeah. Why does that save people? Yeah. That's a really good question, not an easy question, and, and in some ways a difficult question to answer. And the history of Christianity has um, given a variety of these answers. Well, let me bring myself in the picture. Has given this answer in a variety of different ways. I don't know that any one model exhausts the reality. I just finished the video it's not published yet. Um, let's see. Let's clean up here. Ooh, Grill Country's got something coming up. That's always exciting. Da, 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 da. Oh, uh, Chris Pacow's doing his thing. Fun. Uh, da, 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 da. It's still checking. Um, I haven't even made a thumbnail for it yet. Uh, relevance realization of the historical, physical correlation level in the meaning stack. That is an absolutely horrible title, and in some ways intentionally so, because it's one of the more hodgepodgey videos that I made. But these hodgepodgey videos are really important for me because what happens is I sit there with an idea in my head and I'm just churning and churning and churning. I want to make a video on this. I want to make a video on this. And this, this question of text and history and meaning and culture, that whole matrix of questions that Jordan Peterson really got into in his conversation with Douglas Murray and Jonathan Peugeot, this is, a, this is in many ways one of the major conversations that modernity failed to wrestle with well and that we need to really and have a chance at really getting on with as modernity recedes so this isn't exactly on that but this is on this sort of upper this is one of the layers one of the symbolic understandings of sacrifice now there's never a lot of action on the Livingstone's Christian Reformed Church website, but the one video that has actually had some traction was a video I made. This was very early in the video making days when I made a video. Fire of God. Um, when I made a video about altars and I was using a whiteboard. I was playing around with cameras. And so that video is out there and that, that video is by far the, the most viewed uh, video that I, that is on that channel, um, so you can you can go look that one up if you want to, but I but I intend to do something that that hopefully captures this a little bit better. So Michaela asked, well, how can sacrifice make sense? And it's a good question. The first thing you have to think about is fire. Now, if you look at the Matthew Peugeot conversation with Derek Fiedler. Matthew Peugeot makes the observation in that video that fire is light. Let's see, do I wanna do I wanna include these little snippets? How much time do I have? Maybe maybe we can think about this 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 way. Um, okay, we've got fire. So, so you've got this whole matrix of symbols that sort of come together in the Bible. You've got fire, you've got God, the burning bush, I'm a consuming fire, God says. That's the, that's the, the description God gives of himself in, in the book of Exodus. You've got the burning bush, you've got Sinai. 
Um, fire is connected to light. And then there's a, there's a super interesting observation that Jordan Peterson made in his psychedelic video. That psychedelic video. That was, that was a good one. I know I'm, I'm getting a lot of heat from some of you, even just giving attention to it. And my position on psychedelics hasn't changed. I've talked about it enough, but that was a super helpful video for me. All right, I found what I was going to play you, and it's actually in the Daily Wire portion of the conversation between Peterson and um, Carhartt Harris. So I'm just going to leave the still up, and I'm going to play the audio for you. It's... When I heard this section, it just like a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of things popped. You know, I as as I showed in that um, as I showed in that video, I had um, I developed this idea about fire and altars a number of years ago, and but then this little this little tidbit by Peterson is just super helpful. Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, there's there is some indication of that, and that actually it's the deprivation of the fractal structure of the surfaces that's associated with that. Yes, we, we need to, right. you know, we need to come home. That was a little little comment about cities. <laughs> to, to nature. Right. I just did a seminar with a number of very astute thinkers on the biblical book Exodus. And there's a very interesting sub-narrative in Exodus where Moses encounters the burning bush but it's the particulars of the story that I think are relevant to our discussion on YouTube and also to what I want to ask you. So, first of all, it's a burning bush and not a forest fire, right? And so it's actually rather localized, this, this uh, phenomena that, uh, phenomenon that Moses encounters. And phenomenon, by the way, means phanesthi. It's from the Greek. It means to shine forth. Mm. Right, yeah, yeah, it's very, very useful to know that. So basically the story suggests that Moses is out going about his business and something captures his attention, sort of in the periphery. And then he goes to investigate and he sees this bush that's being consumed by fire, hypothetically, but is also replenishing itself. It's not being demolished by the fire. So it's a paradox, right? Now, the fact that it's fire is very interesting because I think that fire is psychedelic in its intrinsic nature. I don't think we apply latent inhibition to fire, which is why it attracts our attentions, like other hyper-biologically relevant stimuli. I don't think we canalize our perception of fire. Now, that, that word canalization is key in this whole conversation. It's not a word that I knew, but they used it enough so that it, it can sort of become part of your con con conversation. Again, this video, Consciousness, Chaos, and Order with Dr. Robin Carhart Harris, it's an astounding video. And again, as I said before, I know a lot of you will skip it because of the psychedelic stuff, but there is so much in this video that is so good. And I'm, I'm now more and more listening to um, all of these major, these really good talks, like the one with uh, Jordan and uh, Matt Ridley, that one also on Daily Wire had a ton of good stuff in the Daily Wire. I hate to tell you that, but it's it's going to happen. And some of these really outstanding conversations, there's just going to be stuff behind the paywall, and it's it's just going to be a reality. So I think that's because we're descendants of those few apes hundreds of thousands or millions of years ago that were so fascinated by fire they couldn't leave it alone. And, and of course, you know, they, <laughs> you know, what campfire is just something that you can sit around. You know, I grew up camping and, and you just sit around and you just can watch that fire. It just, it just continues to fascinate. It, it has the suchness and the moreness that, that is something that, that Verveke talks about. And, and so there's, it's not, it doesn't seem, incidental or accidental that fire is this is this dominant is this dominant metaphor that god uses to describe himself um i am a re i'm a i am a refining fire and you find your thy word you can look at um you look at the psalms thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path i mean all of these all of these images sort of come together in the Bible and and sort of become a nexus, okay? So if you think about that 
And then you think about a story like Leviticus 9 and 10. So the, the little section here talks about Leviticus 9 as sort of the inauguration of the, the sacrificial system. On the eighth day, Moses summoned Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. And he said to Aaron, take a, take a bull calf for your sin offering and a ram for your burnt offering, both without defect, and present them before the Lord. Then say to the Israelites, take a male goat for a sin offering, a calf and a lamb, both a year old and without defect for a burnt offering, and an ox and a ram for a fellowship offering to sacrifice before the Lord, together with a grain offering mixed with olive oil. For today the Lord will appear to you. Now how will the Lord appear to them? Because again, you've got all of this tension in the story about, well, you can't see God. You can't be in the presence of God. I've been reading through Genesis with my with my men's Bible study on Wednesday night. That's a Living Stones Bible study. It's not online. And we had Genesis 3 where Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden. And then when you read Genesis 4, you begin to recognize that in a, in a strange way, um, Cain and Abel are still living in the Lord's presence because after Cain kills Abel, he's exiled from the Lord's presence. And so what you see in, in these stories is that the Lord sort of continues to move away from Adam and Eve. They get kicked out of the garden. There's an angel with a flaming sword, Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel. Abel has to go out from the presence of the Lord. All of this stuff is going on. And so in many ways, the question of the desert wanderings and the question of Israel and the question of the temple is, can a holy Lord live in the midst of an unholy people? And you get all of this machinery around holiness and commonness and um, clean and unclean. And the way that there's, there's always two ways to, or there's often, there's usually three ways to deal with impurity, water for washing, fire for consuming, and blood. Those are sort of the three main ways that, that you navigate the boundaries between, you know, holy and common, um, clean and unclean. And fire is really key because again, fire is as we just fire is as we just saw, sort of the the presence, the presence of the presence of the Lord. So they took the things that Moses commanded in front of the tent of meeting and the entire assembly came near and stood before the Lord. Then Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded you to do so that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. Okay, what's the glory of the Lord? Well, it's fire basically because remember what leads Israel through the desert wandering. It's a, it's a cloud to lead them by day. And they use the light of the sun, obviously, to see the cloud. But you're not going to be able to see the cloud at night. And it's a fire to lead them at night. And when the Lord comes down on top of Sinai, again, the Lord is a fire. But now, God doesn't equal fire. But the manifestation of God in the Pentateuch is often fire. The burning bush, fire on Sinai, I am a consuming fire. Keep that fire imagery present. Moses said to Aaron, come to the altar and sacrifice your sin offering and your burnt offering and make an atonement for yourself and the people. Sacrifice the offering that is for the people and make atonement for them as the Lord has commanded. So Aaron came up to the altar and slaughtered the calf as a sin offering for himself. His sons brought the blood to him and he dipped his finger in the blood and put it on the horns of the altar. The rest of the blood he poured out into the base of the altar. On the altar he burned the fat and the kidneys and the long lobe of the, of the liver for the sin offering as the Lord had commanded Moses. The, the flesh and the hide he burned up outside the camp. Now they used fire. Now, see so you have the offering here. Now, okay, so, so what you do, what they did, maybe I'll go back to the other, the other image here. So, so the way this works is that you have, I, I've, you have the tabernacle, which is the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place. And of course, the Ark is in here. And, and then what you have out here, you'll have an altar and you'll have a basin. You know, the temple basically takes this. And you'll have something that, that separates the people from God. And, and often I'll say that in some ways the, the tabernacle is a divine containment unit. And, and that's not technically correct. But it acts that way because the language, and when if Jordan Peterson gets as far as some of these passages in Numbers, the, the language in the King James is God breaks out. And it's almost like a nuclear reactor. God breaks out and people are, people are destroyed. Now, the idea here is that 
to go a little bit further in here, what is an altar? An altar is, for a lot of us, it's something like a barbecue pit. What an altar is, is, is you have fire on the altar, and the sacrifice goes on top of the altar, and, okay, well, that's how it goes. But now think this through symbolically. What is the fire? Well, the fire is, symbolizes, represents, acts as God. The fire consumes, and also think about, you know, you've got heaven and you've got earth, and the smoke goes up to God. Israel in the desert wandering, the, the cloud and the fiery pillar at night connected, obviously, heaven and earth. Israel was connected with God in his holy temple above the firmament. That's, that's how all this stuff, that's how all this stuff works. Well, let's see. So Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting, and when they came out, they blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. And again, what, what does that mean? How did the glory of the Lord look? The glory of the Lord looked like, I assume, a fire. Okay. Fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat portions on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted for joy and fell face down. So God was there in their presence. Aaron's son, Nadab and Abihu, took their censers, put fire in them and added incense, and they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. So the fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Moses then said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke of when he said, among those who approach me, I will be proven holy. In the sight of all people, I will be honored. And Aaron remained silent. So what's happening? Why this unauthorized fire? What is that? That's, I mean, not any fire is God. God is not fire. When you make a fire, you don't kindle a little bit of God. It's symbolic. And the main fire consumes. So when you look at the death of Nadab and Abihu, in many ways, they are sacrifices. Okay. Well, what about a regular sacrifice? The animal is a substitute. The animal goes into the fire as a substitute for the person. If, again, you read some more of these stories from, from the text, you'll see that in the sacramental, in the ceremonial offering, the head of the family places his hand onto the animal and, in a sense, the sin comes off the man and onto the animal and the animal goes into the fire and then the fire is goes into the holy God and the holiness of God burns the sin away in a sense. This is how altars work. This is why sacrifices work. And you see this in a lot of different ways. You can look at the scapegoat. So with the scapegoat ceremony, there's two goats. One goes up on the altar and the other goes out into the wilderness. Why? Fire, water, wilderness these are all chaotic areas they go out into the chaos when you when a little bit later when they come into the promised land and let's say jericho is put under the ban jericho is in that sense sort of a, an offering you have all these symbolic ways to manage these ideas of well, going into the presence of god which will consume you you'd better be holy that's why if you're taking something a particular kind of thing and and make it unclean to clean, it's fire, it's water, it's blood. Blood outside the body, again, is in many ways chaos. And so all of this symbolism is happening in this, and this is why sacrifices work. Now, I'm just taking examples from the Bible, and someone might say, yeah, but sacrifices have have sort of worked all over the world. Sacrifices is pretty much universal. This one symbolism into sacrifice doesn't doesn't exhaust the idea the idea is again bigger than the um this image of it and and that's what you run into with theology all the time and when when matthew matthew pajot was talking about the layers this is part of what he was talking about 
there's a big discussion right now with respect to substitutionary atonement versus Christus Victor and, and other, ato other atonement symbologies. That's really what we're talking about with respect to these atonement theories. None of these models exhausts the thing in itself. Just like fire doesn't exhaust God. You cannot contain God in anything within the creation, which is exactly why the Hebrews have the commandment, you shall not make a graven image. Because to try to encapsulate God in an image is idolatry because God cannot be reduced down to an element of his creation. Now, God says fire, and in a sense, the flood is another manifestation of God. And blood is a manifestation of God. And substitution is a very common practice in this. And this is why substitutionary atonement is a symbol of atonement and gives us a symbolic conception of how atonement works. There's also Christus Victor, which is sort of a, another sort of a switch where and whereas in a sense you say, okay, you want to try and bind Jesus and Jesus gets taken all the way down into Hades and guess what? You can listen to this in a Keith, Keith Green song. The bars of sin and death and hell can't hold him. The son of man and the son of God is too strong for the devil to deal with. So there's all of these ways that we deal with this. But I, I, I heard Michaela say that. I don't know if she'll watch this or not. Um, and if she has questions, Michaela, you can always contact me. I'd be happy to answer them. But this is, this is sort of a symbolic way to understand sacrifice. And, and John McRae, in his explanation of it, went through basically a, a version of substitutionary atonement, which is, which is pretty common in the Reformation period. Again, right now, a lot of people want to fight about these things. I don't see, unless you have a theory that is really heretical, substitutionary atonement is not heretical. It's biblical, it's well-founded, It's but it's one model that gives us insight into the reality of atonement, which is probably larger than we can capture or conceptualize. And, and in that way, fire is really sort of an apt image because as Jordan Peterson said we don't really get tired of looking at fire so I if you if you find this I hope this helps you